All right, guys, uh, today we're going to be looking at what we call the chain rule. And the chain rule is a ultra critical rule when taking a derivative and really in understanding uh, much of what we do with derivatives and integrals later on in AP, AB or BC calculus. So um, I'm going to start by giving you the definition and you're going to look at it and go, what the heck? And then I'm going to start explaining to you um, what it really is going to mean to you. All right, so we're going to do our best. Uh, it's probably harder on the front end than it is on the back end. It's really not an overly difficult principle. Um, I would venture to say 99.9% .9 of my kids don't have trouble with the uh, chain rule. Now, basically what you're doing on a chain rule is taking a derivative of a composite function. All right, so you know that a composite something is like, is like f of g of x. And the process by which you take a derivative of a composite is function is you start with the outer function and work towards the inner function. It's a little bit different than simplifying because when you're doing PEMDAS, you kind of go to the inside and start simplifying towards the out. But that's not the case on the chain. And you'll see as you're going to these outer functions, you're going to take a derivative of the outer and then you're going to move to the inner function and then you're going to take the derivative of the inner and you're going to multiply them two together. And when you multiply the two together, it kind of links them together, hence the word chain. So you're going to say, I'm going to show you the definition. It's not super pretty, but then when I start showing you application, you're going to start seeing it more clearly. But the chain rule shows up in almost everything. And I'm also going to refer back to, I don't know if you remember, but the very beginning of the definition of a derivative, uh, not the definition of the derivative, but when I was showing you the power rule, I kept on saying things like uh, dx dx and it would cancel or uh, or if I took the derivative of y, I would write 1 times dy dx. That's kind of the chain rule. So I'm going to show you this. Hopefully, you'll be okay. Um, if you're not, you can always send me a uh, an email or a text, and I will straighten you out. But hopefully, after doing enough examples, you're going to be comfortable with it. it. That is usually the case. All right? All right, here we go, guys. The chain rule. Okay, so I'm on page 67 in the book. And I just want to uh, just initially just throw it out there and then I'll start refining it. So the whole idea of the chain rule, I'll tell you what, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this. All right. But the whole idea of the chain rule is that every now and then, like on this one that I'm pointing to, you have a function G with another function on the inside of it. Now that could look as simple as, I mean, sometimes you don't even think of it as a composite function. Like that could look like something as simple as um, f of x equals the square root of x plus 1. Now, when you see that, you really don't think about that as a composite function. But isn't it true that I could have thought about g of x as the square root of x and h of x as x plus 1? And basically what I just did here is I took g of h of x. So basically, I took the h, sorry, I took the h function right here, which is that, and plugged it into my g function, and I ended up getting this. And that would be my f of x. So sometimes you have a basically a function inside of another function. And it could look like something like this. Uh, it could look something like a trig function. This is a sine of an x squared minus 2. This is like a parabola function inserted into a trig function. It could look something like um, a, a natural log. You could have a natural log of uh, x minus 6. That is a linear function inserted into a natural log function. Well, all of these functions, whether they're this or whether they're this or whether they're this, are considered composite functions. And according to the chain rule we're gonna think of that inner part as just U, the letter U, okay? Now, we may or may not go and make a substitution like this and change it to U, but the idea is the U stands for some other function inside of this. Now, this is me not even replacing the other function with U. This is me calling it H of X. But basically, to take a derivative of a composite function, you're gonna start with the outer function and you're gonna take a derivative of it using whatever rule it requires, and this part you're gonna leave alone. So like, you know how normally the derivative of f of x was f prime of x? 
Well, the derivative of g of u is g prime of u. But when we're done, we're going to link through multiplication. We're gonna go back and look at just the inside part of the function, the u, and we're gonna take the derivative of that, hence the derivative of u. On this one, it's a little bit more clear because I don't have u in there, but the letter u, but I'm looking at this as g of h of x. Well, the outer function's the g, the inner function is like my u. So what I'm gonna do is take the derivative of g and I'm just gonna copy this over. So I'm gonna go g prime, a lot of times I'll say the word blah, blah standing for the, the part that's in the inside. So I look at this as like a g of blah or a g of u. So the derivative of g of blah, g prime of, and look, there's the blah right there. Nothing changed about that part. I just took the derivative with respect to the g part. This is my g prime of u. See the same thing? u is here. I know we want to say u are here, but the u, letter u is here, and then h of x, h of x. See how it doesn't change the in, inside part? And then once I've done that outer part, just like this, I was done looking at the g for that. I go back and take the derivative of the u. Here, now that I've written this out, I'm done with the g. I go back and take the derivative of the h of x, h prime of x. Now, for those of you that are really on the ball and you're going, okay, well, why doesn't that take care of the h? And then now you go and take the derivative of x. Well, actually you do. But the derivative of x is 1 dx dx, and the 1 and the dx dx all equal 1. dx dx cancels and leaves me 1. 1 times 1 is 1. So there's really no point in going back and doing all of this stuff because it's irrelevant. All right, so let's look at a practical example here. This is just a big power rule. But when I look at this, I don't see 2x to the fourth. I'm gonna go back. This is what we did the other day. The other day you had a function very similar to this. I'm gonna make it almost exactly like this except the inner part I'm just gonna call x. And if I had that and took the derivative, right, I would go four times two is eight, copy the x down, basically completely ignore it, decrease the four by one and you would get eight x cubed. Now what you're really supposed to do is now that you're done with the outer part of the function, you go back and take the derivative of x. And the derivative of that single x is one dx dx. And this is what we were talking about on day one, except it doesn't do anything, which is why I haven't been writing that. But now watch, now that I have this, the derivative of this, the outer function is the four. Right Now you could argue the two, but the two is just a constant. So two the constants just get carried over. So you'll see that I'm gonna start with this outer function, the power, and I'm gonna go four times two is eight, copy down the blah, cause that's like my u, decrease the four by one, okay? And in doing that, I'm done with the outer function and I've carried the constant over because that eight has the two in it, all right? Now what's left over? What's left over is like my u in my original example. Now that I've taken care of the outer part of the function, the g, now I go back and take the derivative of the inner part. So here, now I go back, now that I've done the eight blah three, I'm gonna go back and take the derivative of the inner part, six x minus five, and I'm going to link it, hence chain rule, to the original part through multiplication. And that's it. So here's two examples again, right here. Here's a function like from the other day, three x to the fourth. And here's a function where instead of having a single x, I put an entirely new function in there in place of x. You can see that three x fourth, three blah fourth. Same process though, four times three is 12. Drop the x down, decrease the four by three and multiply by the derivative of x. The derivative of x is one. I could also write that the derivative of x, I could also write it as x prime. I could also write it as uh, dx dx, but either way, all of those end up giving me a one, which is why I normally don't even consider that. I just go 12x cubed and call it a day. But with the chain rule, I've gotta go, oh, inner function. So four times three is 12, drop down that blah, that part does not change, decrease the four by three. And now that I've done the function on the outer function, which is the power. And again, the three just got dropped down in there. It's in there in the 12 times the four. 
All I have left is the U part, the inner part to deal with. So I link it by going the derivative of that. Now I'm not gonna write this. I'm just gonna actually take the D that, basically I'm going D that DX. I'm taking the derivative of it. What I'm gonna do is skip this part and go 12 blah three. The derivative of that is eight X minus five and I'm gonna link it to the end. And don't forget to put that part in parentheses so it looks like it would be distributed if you had to multiply it all out. And guys, that's the chain rule. All right, so I'm gonna jump down to one, two, three, and four and show you this. And then I'm gonna come back and do these special derivatives here in the middle. Okay, so looking at number one, um, I've actually got it worked out for you, but just real quickly, uh, three times two is six, copy down the blah, that does not change. Decrease that by one is two. And then now that I'm done with the power, the two got dropped down into the six. All I have left is to go back and take the derivative of that, which is 20x plus nine, and I link it there, 20x plus nine. Whether it's parentheses or brackets, doesn't matter. Okay, number two, again, got a power rule here but you've also got a function on the inside. So the derivative of f with respect to this s, and notice I've changed the variable just to show you, it doesn't really matter, is four times three is 12. Copy that down. That's the u that doesn't change initially. Decrease that by one. That takes care of the outer power and the constant because the constant's already in there. Then I go back and take the derivative of the inner part and link that together hence the chain rule. So the derivative of that is 8s minus 20s cubed. So 8s minus 20s cubed. All right, uh, jumping down to number three, yet again, another one. Now, by the way, guys, there's lots of ways to see the chain rule. It's not always with the power. We just don't know a lot of rules yet. So because we don't know a lot of rules yet, we're gonna, it's gonna look like the chain rule is just this power rule thing I'm doing but it's really not, it has way more applications which we'll get to shortly. All right, so again, four times five, uh, five times four is 20. That's the same thing as dropping the four down and going five blah four. The four and five give me 20. Copy down the U part. This is U, right there. Decrease that by one. That takes care of the outside function. Now I go to the inside part and I link it Chain rule, and you get 12r cubed minus seven. And that's it. And again, we're not multiplying any of this junk out. Now in number four, I have a lot of people that do this different ways. Um, I look at number four and I see something cubed. Some people look at number four and they see top cubed divided by bottom cubed. Now if you wanna rewrite this as the top cubed divided by the bottom cubed, it, like I'm saying if, if you rewrote this like this, your answer is gonna look completely different than mine, okay? See, if you do this, then the outer function is the fraction. The fraction is what's holding all this together, right? It's that divided by this. If you look at this thing, the outer function is the cube. The cube is on the outside. Here, it's kind of like the division is, because it's that divided by that. So this is a totally, now your answers are gonna be the same, but they're gonna look vastly different. I'm gonna, I'm basically gonna do this. And if I have room, I'll show, well, I'll show you this one in a second. But why, what's the point? I don't know why people wanna change it to this. It makes no sense when this is pretty easy to do. So here we go. The derivative of f of x is, first I'm dealing with the power. So three blah two. Three, and the blah is just the fraction. Decrease it by one, two. And that takes care of this. And then you go to the inside part. Now what do you see on the inside? That's right, a big quotient. So I'm gonna put a big quotient here and I'm gonna go low, d high is two, minus high, d low is one, and you don't have to put times one, over the low squared, okay? So this is what you do if you're thinking about it the way I originally wrote it. Now, if you're thinking about it the way I have it on the second situation, like right here, if this is your function, now you're looking at it like this, totally different. You're gonna look at this right now as a big quotient. So you're gonna actually go, all right, the derivative is low, right? Because it's not, there's no three on the very outside of the whole thing now. There's just three on each part. It's the division that's holding it all together. So low, you're gonna copy the entire low part. 
And then what do you have to do for D high? Well, for D high, you've got this power chain thing going on. So check it out. This is the low. Now here comes the D high. Three blah to the second times the derivative of the inside part, which is the blah. So here's the low, and then all of this is D high. Then you're gonna go minus, okay? Then you're gonna go high times D low. And to get to the D low part, you're looking at just the low part. There's another power chain little deal going on. Three blah squared times the derivative of the inside part. And then you're gonna put it all over the low part that squared, which really gives you x plus two to the sixth. And I'm gonna show you these two side by side. They don't look anything alike, do they? Nope. But if you really look closely at them, you can kind of see that they're the same. Like here, you've got an x plus two to the sixth on the bottom, right? Well, look what you have here. Here you have a, an x squared there. Here you have an x squared here, but when it comes to finding a common denominator, this is x plus two, I mean, sorry, when you have an x uh, plus two squared and an x plus two squared, that's an x plus two to the fourth, but check it out. This is an x plus two to the sixth, but I have two x plus two squareds in common. And that two and two of those three could cancel with this, leaving me the x plus two to the fourth that you end up having up here. So in reality, you can't really see it completely, but if if I were to foil all that out, uh, I would see this situation um, working out pretty well. All right? So lastly, again, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of doing it this way. If you do, uh, your answer is going to look like this. It's going to be correct. I'm just telling you um, your keys, the key on Schoology is not going to look like this because I typically do them this way. So if you want your key to match my key and feel comfortable about what you're doing, you might want to think about it just as it's written. Now, if I write it like that, I'm probably going to do it like that. Okay, I'm going to go low D high minus high D low. But again, it's low derivative of the high part minus high part derivative of the low part over the low part squared. And I like it when people write x plus 2 to the 6th. I'm just showing you all my little steps here. Okay, so that's an example of the chain rule real quickly. I'm going to go back and show you a couple of other special derivatives, and, uh, and then I'm going to finish out the rest of this classwork. Okay, so the other special derivatives um, are the exponential function and the log function. So the, I'm going to show you these, and then I'm going to show you um, how... Uh, I'm going to talk about AP calculus real quickly. Right here, you'll notice I gave you the G function was e to the u or e to the blah. Okay, and whenever you have an e to a power, the way to take the derivative, which is really nice, is you just basically copy it down. And literally, the derivative of an e function is the e function. So the derivative, the slope, is exactly the same as the value, with one exception. When you're finished copying it down, what does the chain rule always say to do? Once you take the derivative, go back and take the derivative of the blah. Well, the blah part is the exponent. So what your derivative ends up looking like is copy it down. That's the derivative of the e part. And then the chain rule says go back and take the derivative of the u part. That's the du. All right. Now, so remember that for exponential functions, base e. That's all AP Cal will ask you about. Now, because regular calculus in college might not, that might not be the case, I wanna show you about f of a. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, f of x equals a to the x. Now, the difference between a to the x and e to the x is the base a could be anything. It could be a two, it could be two to the x, or five to the x, or seven to the x. Whereas e, e has a value, remember? It's like 2.718, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it's about 2.7. So e is a number like pi in that it is a, a fixed value. A could be anything. Well, the only difference, if you look at the rule, check it out. The difference here, here you are just copying it down, derivative of the blah. Here you are copying it down, the derivative of the blah, the derivative of the x, which in this case is just one. And then you go ln of a. So you go back when you're finished and take the natural log of the base. Now, technically, the derivative of a to the x is really this. 
All right, so if you wanna go copy it down, natural log of A first, then go back and take the derivative of the X, that's totally fine. But a lot of times I'll just write it like this. Now, why don't you do ln of A on the E? Well, you do, but you're doing ln of the base. What's ln of E? That's right, ln of E is equal to one, which is why it doesn't show up here, okay? But if it's not base E and it's base two or base five, you gotta remember to put a ln two or ln five in that derivative joined by multiplication, all right? So in AP Cal, you will not see this on the AP Calculus test, but in my class, this year and next year, I'm going to test you on those just to make sure you're ready in case you have to see it in regular calculus. Um, I'm sorry, in Cal 1 in college. All right? So we're going to do a couple of those examples. You'll see them in a second. Not a big deal. Um, but you just got to gotta learn the formula. Now, and the, if you're wondering why this is the case, the proof of this, you would have to go out to find the derivative, the proof. You'd have to pull out the limit definition of a derivative. And if you pulled out that limit definition, do you remember the f of x plus h minus the f of x over the h as h goes to zero? If you pulled that out and used that as your function and substituted the x plus h in there and did some really clever algebra, you would see the derivative ends up being the function itself times the derivative of the original uh, u. Um, but it's, we're not going to get into that. This is not a proof class, although you very well may see it if you take Cal 1 again in college. All right, now let's look at the natural log rule. Now, the natural log rule is super easy, although it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. The natural log rule says to take the derivative of a natural log of something. Look at it. Your answer just looks like they took the something and put it on the bottom of a fraction. Literally, that's the derivative. The derivative of natural log of blah is 1 over blah. That's it. But because it's the chain rule, the chain rule makes you go back and take the derivative of the blah, so times du. So just like you did with the e to the u times du, you're going to do this 1 over u times du. Now, most people don't like writing 1 over u times du, so with the end in mind, they kind of go, well, if I were to multiply that together, I would get du over u. So most people will write it like that, but that basically means the derivative of the inside part on the top and the u gets sent to the bottom, but that's just doing the derivative and then applying the chain rule and putting it all at one, in one uh, answer. Now, that's for a logarithm that's base e, a natural log. What if it's not base e? What if it's base two, base five, base seven? Well, it's still the same rule, check it out. Put the x on the bottom, the derivative of x on the top. See, instead of du over u, it's dx over x. The only difference, on a log, instead of multiplying by that LNA like we did on an exponential function, I'm gonna divide by that LNA. Now, technically, this is the derivative. Well, technically one over that. That's the derivative. The derivative of the logarithm of blah is to copy the blah on the bottom and then take the natural log of the base on the bottom. The dx is the last thing you do, it's, it's basically saying, go back and take the derivative of x. And by the way, guys, the derivative of x is always one, so don't put it in there. I'm just showing you a formula, okay? If this had been a u right here, then you would have said, copy the u to the bottom, take the derivative of the u on the top, and then multiply the bottom by an LNA. But the derivative of u, the u would have been an entirely different function. Okay, we're going to go through a couple of these examples. You'll see it. Hopefully it won't be a big deal. And if you're wondering, well, why don't you on a natural log? Why did you just put U and then put a DU on the top? Why didn't you put natural log of the E down there? Well, I did. What's natural log of E again? It's one. That's why it doesn't matter here and it doesn't matter there because both of those go away. And the nice thing for you is you're only going to be dealing with natural logs. And when you deal with natural logs in AP Cal, you don't have to worry about log base six or an exponential function with a base four. You don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, but on my test, I will probably give you one problem of each on my test. Um, for you this year, it's multiple choice, so it shouldn't be an overwhelming issue for you. Um, but because uh, you'll have these rules ready to look at uh, on your test. But anyway, um, these are rules that we're going to employ as we finish up our chain rules examples. Okay, so let's just look at the rest of these. We'll knock them out, and then your job is to, uh, is to work on that homework. All right, so here we go. 
Uh, number five, we've gotten through four. So number five right here. Sorry, I got a little shake going. Um, number five, it says h of z is this. And if you're wondering why I'm changing the variables, because you're going to get variables in calculus, which you're going to be doing with volume with respect to time and, and pressure and, and rates of change with, with liquids and piles of cone, I mean, uh, uh, conical piles of sand. You're going to have all kinds of variables. I'm just trying to get you immune to the fact that it doesn't always have to be an x. It could be any variable in there. All right, so let's take a look at this. Um, I'm going to take the derivative of h with respect to z, okay? And I look over here, and what do I see? Well, I do see a quotient, but on the outside of that, I see a power. So when I look at it, I see a chain. The outer function's the 4, the inner function's the fraction. So I'm going to start with the 4 and go 4. All of this is like my u, so 4 blah 3. And then I'm just going to copy that blah down on the inside. And <clears throat> tell me, what have I just done? I've taken the derivative of the outside part. And now that I'm finished with it, I go times, and I come to the inside part. Now, what do I got to do to take the derivative of that inside part? Well, a big quotient rule linked or chained to the other part. So, low, I'm going to write small. D high, 6z minus 2. Low D high. Minus high, 3z squared minus 2z times d low, 0 minus 9, so negative 9. Don't simplify. Over the low, quantity squared. So 4 blah 3 for the outer function, and then quotient rule for this. And again, low, d high, minus high, d low, over the low squared. All right? All right, now check, check out number six. This is a natural log. So this is a natural log. This is like my u. So tell me what was the rule for the derivative of ln of u? Well, for a natural log, if you look back, it says basically put u on the bottom, one over u. So I'm gonna take the u and I'm literally just copying it to the bottom and putting a one on top. All right, now if I do that and then go times, right, that takes care of the natural log because that's the natural log derivative rule. But then I got to take the derivative of that because of the chain rule, right? This is two functions. That's, there's an ln of blah, and there's also this parabolic function. So I now have to go back and multiply by the derivative of this, which is 6x minus 2. Well, I don't want to write that. So what I'm going to do is just get in the habit of going straight to this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to, on a natural log of that, I'm going to copy that to the bottom, and then I'm going to take the derivative of it and put it on the top. And that does the log rule and the chain rule all at once. All right? All right, look at number seven. For number seven, uh, I've got this power on the outside, function on the inside. So I'm going to start with the outer function. So big F prime of T. And by the way, there's a big difference between big F and little f, so don't change the letter just because you like little f's better, right? You'll really see that when you start to get to integration and things like that in calculus. So outer power, negative three times one. Copy down the blah, subtract one. And that takes care of the outer power. Then you go to the inner function. This is where the chain comes in. Inner function, so times the derivative of that, 2t plus three. And that takes care of the inner function. You're done. All right, then move to number eight. I've got an exponential function. That's an e to the u. What do you do? What's the derivative of an e to the u? Well, the rule is copy it down. So literally, the derivative is this. Technically, there's a times ln of e, but we said the ln of e is 1. So literally, the derivative is that. That takes care of the e, but now i got to take the derivative of that because it's the u. It's the inside function. It's the uh, chain part. So the chain rule tells you to go back and take the derivative of that. And this is what I see a lot of times when I see the derivative. And the thing that's wrong about this is it only looks like it's that times this, and then you're subtracting four. So remember to always join all of that to this, or to anything when you're doing a chain rule. Okay? Now, if you look at number nine, number nine, I've got a power on this, and then this does not have a power, but it's a separate function. 
Well, what's the entire, the whole thing is joined by what? The product rule. So the three, because the three is not on everything, it's just part of this function. This is part of this function, but the whole thing is joined together by a product. So I'm gonna do a product. So here I go. First, there's the first part, and then derivative of the second part, and then plus second, there's the second part, and then derivative of the first part. Now, if you look at just that, the derivative of just that is three blah two times the derivative of the inside part, 16x minus five. So first d second plus second, and all of that is d first. Or as you learned when you had three parts, you could just take copy one derivative of the other, copy the other derivative of the one. All right, now this one is similar to number nine, but this has powers on both. So let's check it out. The derivative of g will be first, just copy it down, and then derivative of that. Well, the derivative of that is a power chain combo put together here. So start with the outer, five blah to the fourth, copy the blah down, times the derivative of this, which would be 8x. So all of that right there is my d second, plus regular second, And then all of this will be my d first. Well, let's look at the first part. It includes the three. So three blah squared, copy down the blah, times the derivative of the blah, which is nine x squared minus two. Make sure you got parentheses over all of that. So first d second plus second d first. Now, if you're really technical and you're really looking at this, you'll see it and go, you know, Mr. Hurry, I really didn't need that set of parentheses or this one. And in this case, you're right, because it was all multiplication right here, right? But I like to just group that extra one together so it's really clear to see the individual parts. The first D second plus second D first. All right, now what about number 13, or number 11, sorry. On number 11, we have got a uh, fourth root here. Now, I know we've got a trick for square root, but I don't have one for fourth root. Well, I do, but we're not gonna get into that. It's, worth, it's To me, it's wasting brain cells that, and your answers, ironically, your answers on the AP test will never look that way. So anything other than a square root, I'm not gonna use a, a trick. I'm just gonna change a fourth root to a one-fourth power. Now, you'll notice I'm rewriting it. Um, a lot of people just will, they'll just like scribble through it and put a one-fourth, that's fine too. But notice, this is not the derivative. I'm just rewriting it, getting it ready for the derivative. So don't say that this is f prime. This is just me cleaning up f and putting it in a, in a, uh, in a mode or a form that I will easily handle with my chain rule now. So outermost function, one-fourth, one-fourth, blah, subtract one to the negative three-fourths power. Come in here and copy your blah down. And then once I do that, I've taken the derivative with respect to the outer function. Now I gotta do the inner function, which would be what? 3x squared minus 4x. All right, what about this one? Okay, now this one doesn't have a power on the outside of everything. It's a power on each part. So what's bringing all of this together? That's right, the quotient. So when I take the derivative, I'm gonna start with a quotient rule. And when I get to the D low and the D high, that's when the powers and the chains and all that stuff will come in. So here we go, low part. So low, and then here comes the derivative of the high. So the derivative of the high is four, three X minus two cubed times three. And if you wanna put all of that in a big parentheses to make it clear that you just went low, D high, great, minus, now I'm gonna go high part, there's the high, okay? And now I'm gonna go derivative of the low. Well, there's a two there. So I'm gonna go two blah to the first, I don't have to put the one if it's a one, times the derivative of the inside part, four x. And if you wanna put all of that together to show that you just went high 
D low, and all of that represents the D low, great. It's never gonna hurt you. And then low squared, you can write 2x squared plus 7 squared, and then another parentheses and another squared. But you know when you square a square, it's to the fourth, so I'm just going to put it to the fourth. Okay, so for number 13, um, I'm going to show you two different ways to do it. Uh, the first way I do it is what most people do initially until they start realizing that there's a much more efficient way to take a derivative of a natural log. Um, so the second way is the way I'm probably going to have it written on my keys. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to count off, at least on this first test, for having it the way I'm doing it the first way, but it's just not a great way. So give you a piece of advice and you'll see why in a second. Here's what most people do incorrectly. And if you do it this way, by the way, on the AP test, this answer will not show up on a multiple choice. What I have will probably show up on a multiple choice, but not what you, you will have. So you're gonna have to simplify it, which is just another step. What's the point of that? So here's what a lot of people do initially starting out. They take the derivative and they go, all right, I got a natural log of this big, ugly function with a times three. So initially they just drop the three down and then they go, all right, what's the rule for the derivative of a natural log? Well, the derivative of a natural log we learned was copy all of that stuff down to the bottom. So I'm just going to copy it down, 6x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 2x to the sixth. Now I normally put a one there and if I write one over this, that takes care of the natural log. But it doesn't take care of the derivative of this. So then I would have to go back and go times and put the derivative out to the side. But we learned that putting the derivative on top is a better alternative and it makes a nice, neater answer. So what I end up with is the derivative of this is six, six x to the fourth minus three x cubed plus two x to the fifth times, that takes care of the six, times the inside part, derivative of the inside part, which is 24x cubed minus 9x squared plus 2. Now that's a mouthful at first, but let's take in again what I'm doing. I'm dropping the 3. The derivative of the natural log is copying that stuff to the bottom. That takes care of the natural log. The derivative of the 6, the, that exponent is 6 blah 5 takes care of that. And then the derivative of that is 24x cubed minus 9 squared plus 2, which is there. And instead of stringing it along as a really long chain, I just put the second parts of that chain on top of this. So this is actually a triple composite function. It is this polynomial inside of that powered function inside of that log function times a constant. Now that's the hard way to do it. Now the easy way to do it, and you're gonna see why this is easier in a second, is I'm going to, before I even start this, I am gonna use a log rule that I have that says if I have a power, I could have swung that power to the front and just multiplied it by the number out front. And then the six is no longer there. Now, look what happens now when you take the derivative, right? So what I have right now is an 18 out front. I'm just gonna drop down the 18 You'll see that that's really what I ended up with over here. And then now that constant's there, I'm gonna take the derivative of the log. And how do you take a derivative of a natural log? You just copy that stuff to the bottom. But that only takes care of the ln part. Now you gotta take care of the derivative of that. Well, the derivative of that is 24x cubed minus 9x squared plus two. Now, when you look at these two answers, they look very different at first, but if you go back and go, wait, I've got five of those here, six of those here, I can cancel all five of those with five of those six, and what does it leave me? 18, that, and that. And the nice part is, over here, if I do it this way, just swing it over first, I don't have to bother simplifying and I'll have an answer that's more likely to show up as a multiple choice question. So that's number 13, okay? All right, so I'm gonna jump back to 14. Number 14 is an exponential function. All right, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. So how do I deal with that exponential function, E? Well, I've got a rule. So to take the derivative of this, what I'm told to do is copy the four down because it's a constant. And then what's e to anything? What's the derivative? It's itself, e 
to that thing. That's like a big giant U right here. So to take a derivative of e to the blah, it's e to the blah. Uh, technically, it's e to the blah times ln of e, but ln of e is one, so I don't bother writing it. Now guys, that takes care of the four that I dropped, and now I've taken the derivative of e. But what do I have left? The derivative of that. So I link it through the chain rule, and how do I take the derivative of this thing? Well, it's hard to see that, but you're looking at your number 14. You start with the outer function, six blah to the fifth, that takes care of the six, and then the derivative of that, eight x cubed minus five. And you link, there's the e, there's copying it down, that's the derivative of the e, then the derivative of this power of six, then the derivative of the very inside part right there. And now that you've taken the derivative of all the parts, that's the chain rule, all put together. All right, last two. I told you I was gonna give you one problem each on a test. Well, I've done it on the homework too. This is not log of e or ln, this is log of four. Remember, there's that one extra step we do here. Let's see if I can remember it. So to take the derivative, what would be a good, a good idea, good thing to do before you got started? Swing that two out to the front. So it's no longer there. By the way, every year I have somebody who swings it out to the front but still leaves it there. Once you swing it, it's gone, man. That six is now there with that three. It's right there, don't use it anymore. So I'm not gonna use that two anymore. So how do I take the derivative of this? Copy the constant. All right, so here I am with a log. What's the rule for taking a derivative of log of blah? Well, you copy the blah to the bottom. And then because it's base four, instead of base e, you divide by ln of four. That's the log rule. That's the derivative of the log. But the derivative of the chain says times the derivative of this, 3x squared minus 5. But I don't want to go times 3x squared minus 5 and put a 1 there. I'm just going to put the 3x squared minus 5 on top. And the 2 could technically go on top also. It probably looks a lot better on top. Um, but anyway, I'm just showing all my steps here. And then finally, 16. For 16, I've got exponential function. So how do I take the derivative of an exponential function? Drop the constant. Don't have to worry about that anymore. And then what's the rule on exponentials? The derivative is copy the problem down. That is literally the derivative rule. But when it's not base e, I've got to multiply by ln of three. Now I think I had that at the very end, but it doesn't matter. So three blah, copy the problem down, take the natural log of the base, that is the derivative of the exponent. What's left? The derivative of the u. So 8x minus 3. And if you want to put that in parentheses too, you can. You can put all four of these parts in parentheses. But technically, it's okay like this. All right, guys. I strongly encourage you to do your homework um, and to check it and um, correct it. Ask any questions. Uh, good luck to you, and um, I'm, I'm here. I'm an email, phone call, whatever, text away. Uh, feel free to use me as a resource. All right.